Welcome to another episode of Off the Menu. I'm your host, Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House, here with a gratitudinal Charles Coulomb. Gratitudinal. Gratitudinal. Full of gratitude. Well, you know, it is true. I am I am in the autumnal afterglow of Thanksgiving. I've just waddled over from our Thanksgiving dinner, being that Thursday is not a holiday in Austria. Uh, we all have, a bunch of us expats had a Thanksgiving dinner today, tonight. And I ate a lot of turkey and a slice of delicious pumpkin pie, ladies and gentlemen, plus Chinese dumplings. And I'll tell you, it was a huge dinner, and it was great. And I'm quite quite happy. Uh, but there's more. Getting Coming back, I got a little, how do I put this nicely? Sentimental. Sentimental. And I started thinking, don't be shocked, ladies and gentlemen, of the past. You've been stuck in this the past three weeks. I think we our adjectives were like retrospective and then sentimental and now gratitudinal. You're just coming up with adjectives for the same situation. Well, I can't help it. The president <laughs> is such garbage. What do you want out of me? <laughs> but it's not just that the president is utter crap. It's also the fact that it's that time of year. Well, I think, you know, it's it's still the year, the month of the holy souls, you know. My uh, my mother's birthday, she'd be 98, was earlier this week. On the 23rd was the ninth anniversary of Brother Leonard Mary dying. Uh, you know, it's, it's, my mind's very much with those now long gone by. And you know who I was thinking of today? Who? The late, great Virginia O'Brien. Now, you probably never heard of her. Correct. Well, that's all right. She died in 2001, but she was a very old friend of mine from days gone by. I met her at the Masters Club years ago, uh, and she had been a singer in some of MGM's biggest musicals, and she had starred with Julie Garland and a whole bunch of other stars of Hollywood's golden age. In the days when MGM used to say, there are more stars in our lot than there are in the heavens. And not just her, but uh, Henry Brandon and people like that. You know, I'd listen to them at the club, reminiscing about the old days at MGM, and Paramount, and working with various stars, etc. But Virginia still had a tremendous voice. And so in 1984, she recorded at the Masters Club. I remember because I was there. She recorded uh, an album, a live album which was um, Virginia O'Brien Salutes Great MGM Musicals. And she sang a lot of them. I listened to a number of them tonight. And it was a little bit, it was kind of poignant, partly because I was there when she recorded them. And, you know, the, the timber and intonations took me back 38 years. And she was a very, very fine lady. She was a good Catholic. Um, Really fine performer, very, very, very lovely person, all in all. Also, she knew Criswell, so you know that by itself would, would adhere her to you. Uh, in fact, when Criswell died, I looked at his obituary. We were sitting in the bar at the Masters. I read the obituary. I said, well, Criswell died. I said, you know, he, uh, uh, the old charlatan was my landlord. And she said, don't ever call him a Charlotte. I knew Criswell. It was a very, very nice fellow. And I said, well, uh, yes, I am. But she, that was the way she was. She, uh, she never, all the stories she had to tell about that golden age of Hollywood, there was never one that was mean-spirited. Mm. She never, and she never uh, told, you know, she would told, tell some funny stories about people like you know, Clark Gable and so on. But never, never bad ones, never nasty ones, never ones that made them look other than silly sometimes, but, you know, not bad. Yeah. She was just a, a really decent individual. And that got me to thinking about, 
you know, so many of the other people I've known, boy, I've been fortunate. They don't make them like that anymore. They really don't. But she uh, she was a very funny lady in her uh, uh, manner of singing because she had this deadpan thing she would do that she was famous for. And she would just, you know, sing her songs dead like this. Well, th that came about because she was doing a live show called uh, Meet the People, I think, in 1942. And uh, she got stage fright and she just froze and sang her songs just like, you know, totally dead, and the audience loved it. So they, the director told her, "I don't know what you did, but keep it in." <laughs> and that was the beginning. She did a whole career off being Miss Deadpan. That's funny. Yeah, I mean, what I what I I loved about that place and those sorts of people is that they remained from a time when. Hollywood was still a human place. They buried her in uh, your forest lawn. Yeah. Well, actually, a different. Uh, well, it's in Glendale, so I don't know. In Glendale, the original yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. She was a registered Republican, and she adhered to Catholicism. Yep, true on both counts. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty as charged. Guilty Your Honor. as charged. <laughs> <laughs> oh man I'm, I'm so sorry I'm so sorry to have to break the news to you but for all you all you would be Virginia O'Brien fans out there who are turned off by the fact that she was a Catholic Republican deal <laughs> her dad had been deputy chief of uh, the LAPD Chief mm -hmm. O'Brien yeah she had a, a long history in the big nowhere hmm Anything else you're you're thinking about that's in your brain? Well, yeah, yeah. Just the multiplicity of people, places, and things I've known in my life. I I really been I've been very very fortunate. I really have. I'm very very grateful for it all. Um, grateful to be where I am now. You know, I'm honestly. Gratitude is how I feel pretty constantly. It's, I could never have dreamed up such a life when I was a young man. I've, everything really good that's happened to me, I've blundered into. You know, it's like five years ago, my publisher says to me, you know what we should do? What we should do is a podcast. I said, What? He said, yeah, we'd, we'd have you on every now and then. It wouldn't have to be every week. Could be eventually. But we would we would do a show and you'd, you'd answer random questions from the audience. And, uh, you know, what would you call a thing like that? And I said, well, uh, well, I like to deal with things that are bizarre and outre. So how about off the menu? But it was it was born, if you recall, not really out of any deep, dark planning. No, I mean, um, what is it Beverly Stevens basically said you've got to, you know, just giving me some business advice, and you've you've got to put him in front of a camera. Yeah. And um, I was well, super I... super nervous about it, but I recognized that what she said was true. Um. So, but yeah, so but it was we're... a light thing. I don't know. It was just I I, I don't. It, it was kind of random that we when we decided to do that. It was. It was very random. And I remember uh, Brexit occurred like a week or two after we started doing it. Yeah, that was so episode three. It. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so it, it's, um, you know, we've got on and here we are, our 251st episode. Yeah. It, you know, it, it's, it's fun looking at those things. You know, we keep getting these comments as where Charles predicted the future here. Uh, <laughs> and you're pretty close, right? Like, <laughs> Well, you talk about like what would happen if like a flesh eating disease like Ebola or something happens and how the government would react, you know. So you've got those sorts of things like oh Charles predicted COVID. Um, well, no, Charles didn't predict COVID, but he did have an idea of how governments would react to something like that. Yeah. Now the the downside with all of this, since apparently COVID was not the Black Plague, is that if we ever do get something really 
a real problem. Uh, the governments react in the same way, but their peoples might ignore them until we've all got it. Mm. So that's why the boy that cried wolf, you know, is uh, is something that governments should have tattooed on their rear ends with branding irons. Right. Well, you know, it's weird. I, I, I noticed that, right? It encourages, uh, what is it, civil disobedience, which is yeah. not a great thing when your government just inherently encourages that. It, well, I mean, it shows that they're stupid and moronic and that they'll eventually be replaced by people who aren't. Unfortunately, people who aren't stupid and moronic aren't necessarily pleasant or nice. That's right. the downside. However, on a happier note, and there's always a happier note if you know where to look, tomorrow, t the sun will come out tomorrow, so you got to hang on till tomorrow, come what may. Well, or in the immortal words of uh, Virginia O'Brien, helter skelter, I must run for shelter. Till the clouds roll by. But the first Sunday in Advent is in real time yesterday for you Monday watchers, today for you patrons. It's tomorrow for us in the here and now. Wow. Advent, Advent is here. Christmas is coming. The geese are getting fat. Please to put a penny in the old man's hat. If you had the penny, a halfpenny will do. If you had the halfpenny, God bless you. Mm. And not just that. Today is the 26th. So, uh, Sunday will be the 27th. The 28th is when they'll see this. So Wednesday will be the great and glorious Feast of St. Andrew. Uh, right. Um Patron of Scotland. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Up the McKinnon. That's my Scots clan. I just had to, you know, do that for them. McKinnon's everywhere. From the Isle of Skye to the Isle of Egg. You have nothing to lose but our delicious strawberry. And wait, there's more. Because waiting the week after is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And wait, there's more. There are all sorts of feasts, St. Lucy's Day and Our Lady of Guadalupe. There's the Misas de Gallo, the uh, Simbangabi of the Filipinos, the, the Rorate Masses, uh, Los Pastores, Las Posadas. There's all kinds of groovy Advent stuff, Advent calendars. And tomorrow is that first candle on the Advent wreath. And all you Jesse Tree fans, you know what you know who you are. You know what to do. And another good thing tomorrow is to set up your your uh, uh, what do you call it nativity set. Missing, however, the baby Jesus, the shepherds, and the wise men. Why? Well, because you don't really need the baby Jesus and the shepherds until Christmas Day or Christmas Eve before you go to mass. And you don't need the wise men, the kings, until the epiphany. So that's all waiting, ladies and gentlemen. The, the whole panoply of Advent and Christmas lore starting tomorrow and crawling on definitely until the, the 6th of January and to some degree until Candlemas on February 2nd. Think of it, ladies and gentlemen, of all the wonderful things waiting for you this coming few weeks. Be happy. Enjoy it. Mingle the, the nostalgia for the past with whatever joys you can in the present and hope for the future. New Year's Eve is coming. It's all there waiting for us, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope that you will all have a blessed Advent with as much penance as you can slip in between this and that, and a, a truly blessed and glorious and enjoyable Christmas. 
Mm, that was beautiful, Charles. That really gets me psyched. Um, no, it should, because you know what? Uh, what where Santa Claus appeared? Arcadia. Well, well, not yet. Okay, not where? Yet. Well, he showed up in New York City at the end of the thing of the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade to signal the beginning of the Christmas shopping season, as he always does. Of course. <laughs> and to, and uh, tomorrow night in Hollywood at the Santa Claus Lane Parade, he'll show up. All right. At the very at the very end. Are you going to go down to the Santa Claus Lane Parade this year? I didn't even know there were, I've never even heard of that before, actually. Santa Claus Lane Parade? Well, I think they call it the Hollywood Christmas Parade now, but it's oh, the same okay. thing. I've heard of that. Um, well, it's the Santa Claus Lane Parade. Hmm. Just, you know, that's that's what real people who have lived in Hollywood call it. Oh, I see. Okay. Not to be confused with newbies. Gotcha. Uh, I probably am not. Is, is it worth uh, seeing? It's always worth seeing. Different three, third or fifth rate uh, celebrities will be there, marching bands, floats, and at the very end, the Christmas shopping season will come to Southern California in the person of Santa Claus on his sleigh drawn by his reindeer. When I was a little boy in Hollywood, I couldn't go, I couldn't go caroling in the snow, but we had the Santa Claus Lane Parade. We also had the uh, Christmas displays in the Broadway department store on Hollywood Boulevard. They don't have those anymore. Yeah. Um, so for your advent, um, are you going hard on the uh, the pennants? I can't. Yeah. I'm afraid I've, I've got a <laughs> – let's just say this year my health isn't going to allow it. Right. In years gone by, I have. Hmm. But I'm not really in a position to at the moment. It's, uh, but the payback, of course, is that Christmas isn't going to be uh, all that great for me either. Because if all goes as hoped, I'll be recuperating from my surgery. But uh, I won't be able to play Master of the Revels this year. I'm afraid I'll have to leave that to other hands. So, um, let's get into some of the, the the sort of the spiritual side of the calendar. So, uh, just a reminder. So, um, plenary indulgence to um, the person whose grave you visit for the rest of uh, November. Am I right that Pope Francis had changed that? So it's the whole month. The whole November? month. Yeah. So, if you see this in time and are able to get to mass suitably and do that that's a that's a big i i have i forgot to do that again i did that last year for my dad i'd like to do it again um so that's a big one that's really important yeah. i'm gonna remind my mom um and um but let's let's get into um can you tell people uh some suggestions about how to keep a penitential advent well sure uh remember that the the purple in the vestments for Advent is just like those of Lent. And like Lent, there's one Sunday, which is in old rows to show uh, not pink. Old rows, you got that? It's not pink. All right. Um, which is to show that it's a penitential season. So what do you do? Well, it's very hard, I know, to avoid Christmas parties and that kind of thing. But to the degree that you can, do. Uh, to the degree that you can abstain from meat, that you could do what you would do during Lent, do it. I mean, there's no requirement like Lent. But the more penitentially you keep Advent, at the very least, during the day. Because very often there'll be, um, you know, evening celebrations and so on. If you're Filipino and you go to Singbang Gabi, it's a big deal. But you can do other penances. You could go without food during the day if you know you're going to be eating a lot at night. There are things you can do. Um, remember, too, that traditionally Christmas Eve itself was a day of uh, abstinence. Now, the Italians got away with this. With their yes, 12... the Feast of the Seven Fishes, am I right? That's right. 
Yeah, it's they, a really uh, penitential day. Yeah, it's it's very penitential. <laughs> and so uh, the they, the Slovaks uh, have carp in their bathtubs for this time for this period. Yes. Why do you say that? Was it yes? I, Why well, do you say that like that? Why don't you say it triumphantly? Yes, my people have carp in their bathtubs. Why don't you say that? Like you know, pride, Slovak pride. I I think that's embarrassing. For one to have a fish in your bathtub. Number two for it to be carp, and number three for you to actually be eating carp. There's an old fisherman's joke on how to cook carp. <laughs> you preheat the oven to uh, 400 degrees. You get a big wooden board. You put the carp <laughs> on the board. You nail it to the board. Put it in the oven. Then you uh, after an hour or so, you take it out. And then you eat the board. Now, okay. Now you see how, how nasty that is to say? <laughs> what an attack on your people's heritage that is? Look, this hey, is the second time tonight. Let, let me tell you something. You guys complain about mackerel? You guys complain yeah. about the commissary? Wait yes. till you get a load of carp. Oh, is that a promise or a threat? <laughs> happy Christmas Eve dinner, you happy workers. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Uh, if you want a mutiny on the Punitai Road, you feed that boy yeah, carp. I'm going to give you what you want good and hard. <laughs> you, see, you you try getting Tyrone to eat carp. He's going to come out shooting. You know, you, you you don't know. You don't do that to that man. No, I, I, I think you should just be ready to go home on Christmas Eve. Take a bath. Say hi to Skippy or whatever your name is. And then bring him to the kitchen. That's horrible because you're humanizing the fish and then you're killing the fish. <laughs> little Skippy? Yeah, little Skippy. That's terrible. L- little we don't Skippy name the, the things that we don't name the things that we eat. Actually, I, I don't think so. I, I wonder if these. You sound like do. that's not true. You've never lived on a farm, have you? Actually, I don't know if that's true. Uh, Brian from Texas, you know who you are. Do you do you name your chickens <laughs> and your your other livestock before you? butcher them and then cook them i i'd really be interested to know you know you sound like alice in through the looking glass talking to the red queen well the red queen tells her she can't eat food she's been introduced to okay that's that's what you're saying okay. basically so little skippy the carp gets to gets a, a pass huh why does your name little skippy anyway <laughs> it's kind of a stupid name if you ask me a carp should have a, a more robust name, you know, like, like Boris. Boris the carp? I like yeah. that. I kind of like that. Boris the carp? Yeah. I like it better than Little Skippy. Yeah. Well, carp are big fish anyway, so. Yeah. yeah. So why would you call them little in any case? That doesn't make any yeah. sense. I know. Um, all right. Um, Poor Little Skippy. He's even misnamed. So sad. So one, you know, one more question because I myself am trying to plan this out. How I'm going to make an <coughs> event penitential. Um, so how do you reconcile sort of all the feel good aspects of Christmas with like the suffering of a penitential? You know. Well, it's hard. Know? It's extremely hard to do that. Uh, and it does require a certain amount of will, as you might say, um, especially when you've got kids, because, you know, you don't want to spoil right. things for right. them, but you also want to teach them what the reality of the situation is. Yeah. Uh, all I can say is that a good rule of thumb is always, as with Lent and Easter, the more penitential you are during Lent or Advent, the more celebrative you should be with Christmas and Easter in direct proportion. So if you're going to uh, give your kids a rigorous advent, you better make sure that 12 days are magical. That's because if you don't, the world will show them something else and you won't like it. Hmm. Interesting. Well, it's, it's true. I mean, you know, uh, and the other thing too is that you you should not give <coughs> Christmas parties of your own during Advent. 
if you can avoid it. But be sure to give parties between Christmas and uh, and the Epiphany, or maybe even an Epiphany party or a Twelfth Night party on the night of the fifth. Um, especially because by then, people are a little bit recovered from Christmas per se. I think that would be that's a pretty good attractive idea because it's more parties right so it elongates yeah. everyone else's <coughs> party calendar it sure does and of course if you're in an area where you can possibly get a hold even if it's sadly in a non-catholic church if you get a hold of a um, boar's head festival or feast those are great things they're usually the ordinary at parishes are starting to have them more and more i'm glad to see uh, oh and that's the other thing Speaking of the ordinary, if you're near a church that has Advent carol services and that kind of thing, use them. You know, in the ordinary, uh, that's one thing they brought over from Anglicanism that's really a worthwhile and enjoyable tradition. Uh, they have they have uh, services of carols after Advent as well. I mean, after Christmas. So uh, then there are other things you could look into. Uh, the corresponding period in the Byzantine rite is called St. Philip's Fast. Uh, so also look and see what the Eastern rite churches in your area are doing. Uh, mix it up. You know? Don't be afraid to explore the Catholic universe. And this is true if you know of a, of a Catholic uh, ethnic parish near you. See what they're doing that's unusual. All you right. know, Polish or Lithuanian or Mexican or whatever you like. Uh, you'll see what they're doing. Get out of your, your comfort zone, as it were, and uh, celebrate the season with your Catholic brethren. Hmm. All right. Um, are you ready for State of the Week? Yes. All right. Uh, I think a, a person, I think a, a woman named Carolina uh, requested that you do Wisconsin for State of the Week. Woo, woo, Wisconsin. Well, that's a cheesy choice. Indeed. On Wisconsin, on Wisconsin. Okay, that's enough. We've done enough. Okay, we don't, we're not going to sing on Wisconsin, are we? What is that from? I've never heard that before. I think it's the Wisconsin State uh, fight song. Oh. Okay. But you're not interested because you don't care about the cheese hats. Nah. All right, fine. I don't care. I remember when they were playing the Rose Bowl one year, and the bar of the Ritz Carlton Huntington was filled with people wearing cheese heads, cheese slices on their heads, literally. That was many years ago. That's an abomination. Anyway, the Ritz Carlton and these people are dressed like that? That, well, they were all wearing normal clothes. They just had these hats on. How did you feel about that? How did that make you feel? Uh, like ordering a fifth drink. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. Uh, okay. Took a cab home. You know, wasn't wasn't really interested in finding John and Law. <laughs> I, thought, I thought this boy got to go home now. <laughs> Be a little too close to the Rose Bowl in this part of the world. We got to move. Well, the long and the short of it was that I went to um, Wisconsin. Been there several times. I suppose we should start with uh, Milwaukee, which is their biggest city, I believe. A really uh... now, mind you, I have to confess, my first cousin is a member of the state assembly of Wisconsin. I won't say who he is, but and we don't have the same name, but he is, in fact, the uh, my first cousin on my father's side, i.e. the son of my aunt. But she married an Anglo, so you'll never guess by the name. My Uncle Kitch. Mm. So, uh, but he's a solid conservative, which is good. You know, I'm looking at the map right now in... I'm just shocked at how close Milwaukee is to Chicago. For some reason, yeah, I never look at the map of Wisconsin, and I always assume Minneapolis was right near Milwaukee. But 
That's no, really so far it, away. Yeah. yeah, it is far away. Wisconsin is a whole world unto itself, the land of a thousand lakes. Um, they have a lot of Indians in Wisconsin. Hey, I, I thought Minnesota was the land of a thousand lakes. Well, that too. They got lakes all <laughs> over the Northwest. Lakes everywhere. Minnesota, okay. Wisconsin. Okay. And they have the land of lakes butter that got rid of the Indian chick. Did it? We, we get land of lakes. Wow. Yeah, but they don't have the Indian Is it a deer? anymore. Is it the deer? Wait. No. No, I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Land of lakes. Land of lakes. They changed the logo because of the morons. Stupid morons. Oh, I see what you're talking about. Okay, yeah, there's... Yep, the morons struck again. Wow. Isn't that stupid? Well... I, 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 I just don't understand. Isn't that celebrating, a, like, heritage? Like, isn't that, like... I, I just see, don't when understand. See, when you're stupid, when you're stupid... It just it's stupid people being stupid. Look, my own alma mater, Bishop Alamany High, we were the Alamany Indians. But you know, oh the little purslip brigade attacked. Do you see that red blanket over there? No. Well <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. Red Redskins? Yes, that's what it says, Washington Redskins. And if you don't like it, you don't have to come to my home. So I'm just I'm tired of weenieism. Weenies stop. Weenies go roast yourselves. The only weenies that I have any respect for are Oscar Myers people. You think they're ever gonna do something to Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben's? It's done. Is it? Past tense. Oh, no. They were shuttled off with the Indian lady. Wow. And you know, what's, you know what's really funny about that? The original Aunt Jemima? What? When she retired, she was a millionaire. A black millionaire. At a time when there weren't so many black millionaires. Stupid people who don't know any history are stupid people. That honestly, that's so sad. That that's my reaction to that. That's just sad. I, it doesn't make me angry. It's just like it gets me angry. It's weenieism uh, triumphants. Weenies should not be determining things. Weenies should shut up because they're weenies, right? If you're a weenie, why talk? Just cower in your bedroom and stay there. That's my advice to weenies. Nobody needs to hear from you. Nobody needs to, to hear you blather on. You know, anyhow, it seems to me that excising all images of blacks and Indians from advertising and all that is a way of obscuring, if anything, their very existence. You know? Yeah, 100%. And if you say, oh, it's cultural appropriation, well, then that means that blacks and Indians shouldn't be allowed to wear or use anything that's white. And then where would they be? So, anyway, spare me. Um, so, anyhow, we were talking about Wisconsin. We were. And so, regardless of the Land of Lakes lady being kicked off with uh, Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima to uh, exile to a, a prison planet <laughs> in the Star Trek universe. <laughs> now, there is there is a future Star Trek episode. They land on a prison planet that's loaded with characters who have been been uh, thrown out of Earth for being politically incorrect. They're oh. greeted by Uncle, Jen, uh, Uncle Ben, Aunt Jemima, Mrs. Butterworth. Okay, here, I'm, I'm going to throw... Lady, yeah, sorry. And Uncle Ramus. I'm gonna throw you a curveball. What about Quaker, huh. what about Quaker Oats? White supremacy. Get rid of it. Are they going to? I mean, is that going to turn into a thing? Like seriously? I I have no idea. It would if the Quakers were nastier people. I think. <laughs> you know, but they're so bland. There's not much you can say about the Quakers. Okay. And they're not going to stand up for themselves anyway. Besides, <laughs> they're proud. 
Let me tell you something. The biggest thing the Quakers have had going for them for a century has been the logo on the Quaker Oats thing. <laughs> it's true. I mean, what have you ever heard about from the Quakers except the Friends Service Committee being pro-communist? What have you ever heard about them? Nothing. And what do we, if I say Quaker, what's your first thought? Uh, Quick Quaker Oats. Oats I, honestly. Yeah. So we get him off there and, and call it just Oats. That's sad. You know, or Weenie Oats. <laughs> weenie Oats? Weenie Oats with a picture of a stupid weenie. Maybe Gavin Newsom. <laughs> Gavin Newsom's face instead of the Quaker man. What do you think? <laughs> I think that would immediately <laughs> just die. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I can't do some oats. <laughs> new some oats? That kind of yes. can work, but his new face, though. Oats. You see his stupid face. <laughs> and then you, but you keep, uh, you keep the, you alter the legend. So say nothing is better for thee than me. It becomes nothing is better for you than me. <laughs> Gavin Newsom offering himself to America. Oh, he wants to be president. Don't you kid yourself. That's impossible. <laughs> that, that, that can never happen. You, you know, you're the That's... guy who told me they'd never elect a senile person. I, well, no, I don't, I don't know if I said that. I said they would never elect someone with glasses because that's, that shows weakness. Harry Truman would beg to differ. So I mean, Teddy that was Roosevelt. a different time. And also overweight, overweight. I, I think I think America is very fickle on that on that score. I think William Howard Taft deserves an apology. Was he? Was he? Uh, well, he was on the television. That was what? pre-television. No, no, God knows he wasn't on the television. <laughs> that is so true. He was on the television. <laughs> But why should – you know who I think should be president uh, of the United States next would be the male half of the uh, of the Calvin Klein duo. Let's not even get go there. I, the, I have too much respect for our audience to go there and to put that image in their mind. I think he represents what we've become as a people. Okay, if you want to see what Charles is talking about, it's the latest Calvin Klein duo that is really nasty. Or, <laughs> I'll say they are so nasty. I mean, un- there's a rather cruel meme that compares them to Mark Wahlberg and his uh, squeezette in 92. Woof, that's a cruel thing to do. All right. Anyhow, we've we've really we're really running wild let's, on this show, but let's get back to Wisconsin. Yeah, let's stop disrespecting Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yeah. All right, now Wisconsin, great state. I love Wisconsin for a number of reasons. Milwaukee is a wonderful town, home to Laverne and Shirley, and happy days. Uh, but amongst the wonderful things you'll see in Wisconsin, uh, in Milwaukee rather, my personal favorite is the Joan of Arc Chapel at Marquette University, which in fact was a chapel that Joan of Arc worshipped in and was moved there, lock, stock, and barrel. The cathedral in Milwaukee used to be really beautiful, but unfortunately, Milwaukee was cursed, and I do mean cursed, with an evil prelate called Rembrandt Weekland. And sadly, Rembrandt Weekland's handiwork remains until today. Nevertheless, you should still see the cathedral just because you're there. You know, the only thing I know about Weakland is I remember the John Sr. quote. Yeah. If, Weakland, a... if Weakland's in, who is out? Exactly. Exactly. But there are other places I could recommend you look at. Uh, St. Stanislaus, Old St. Mary's, the Jesus, and you have Lincoln. Uh, all of them really need. St. Stanislaus is now the uh, headquarters of the Institute of Christ the King in Wisconsin. Uh, so that's quite nice. You're skipping away from Wisconsin, and there are Polish and German restaurants and really and bars and stuff, really great stuff. You can move on to the state capital at Madison, which, like most state capitals, has, which you might expect, a capital. Beautiful court buildings. So lovely, lovely town. I've not spent a great deal of time there. Green Bay. I'm really, really a fan of. 
It was founded by the French, you want to see St. Francis Xavier Cathedral, a couple of the other downtown churches. Uh, just a really, really very nice place. The Door Peninsula uh, was settled heavily by Belgians. And there's a shrine there, a Marian shrine. Oh, golly, what is it called? Our Lady of something. But it's the only approved Marian apparition in the United States. Uh, and I, I can't rely on my memory anymore. Wisconsin, apparition, shrine, not Naseda. A Lady of Good Help is a champion. Uh, yes, that's the one in Champion, uh, Wisconsin, the National Shrine of Our Lady of Good Help. The uh, if you cross the state in the south, you come to Prairie du Chien, which also has a lot of uh, Prairie du Chien, which also has a lot of French pioneer architecture and all that, the Villa Louis, and things like that. A beautiful old church. Um, Northwestern Wisconsin, I've spent very little time in, just driven through it, really. Uh, stopped in some lovely places, and that allows me to <clears throat> end with an institution that you'll find all over Wisconsin. Now, you'll see them elsewhere in the Midwest, and once upon a time, they were a national institution. But Wisconsin is particularly renowned for them. What are they? Supper clubs. And what is a supper club? Well, dark wood, red leather, neon sign, steak, seafood, uh, cocktails. Usually some sort of live entertainment, very often dancing. And these are supper clubs. They're not, they're often anyway, not quite as elaborate as they were in days gone by, but they're still with us and still worth visiting. <clears throat> they often have wonderful names, you know, like the, the Brass Key or the the, uh, the Silver Nail or, you know, things like that. Uh, just very often family-owned and, and often enough older than I am. And I really recommend uh, Wisconsin's Supper Clubs. And there, I think, I've told you all I can. They're you know, the Apostles Islands, too, but I've never been there. That you know the supper club thing for Wisconsin is really surprising to me because I I personally <laughs> picture something more urban, more ritzy, you know. Well, they were they were in major cities when they had them, hmm. but they're still they're quite nice, you know. Yeah. There's even if you if you look online, I believe there's I've not seen it, but there's a book that's a guide to the supper clubs of Wisconsin. But well, they do have them throughout the upper Midwest, although Wisconsin is very proud of this. Hmm. All right, Charles, thank you for that. Um, okay, uh, shameless plug for Patreon. Uh, I, you know, actually, I really wanted to let everyone know who's listening to us through um, the audio version of the podcast, not through YouTube, but through the audio that, um, you know, we have a special benefit for our patrons uh, for the. Um, for the pre-show, you I upload an audio file so you can listen to the audio version of the pre uh, pre-show special just for you. Usually, I up those uh, upload those on Saturday night, so I just kind of wanted to let you um, you guys know that uh, we are making accommodations uh, for people who just simply uh, want an audio upload, yeah, to listen to the you know the show and potentially the pre-show. So that's there for you for as low as five dollars a month. All right. Uh, You're the first on your block. That's operators right. Are, operators are standing by. Act now. Batteries Point not included. <laughs> Point where <Yeah>, prohibited. Batteries. <laughs> batteries not included. Some assembly required. Oh, man. Um. <laughs> All right. Um, question from Chicago Jacobite. Uh, who says, Ave Carolus uh, et Vincentius. I recently had a thought that I have never encountered before anywhere. Whenever moderns mention ancient Rome, they invariably only point to their excesses and cruelties, but never to their achievements. 
Uh, do you think, as I always had, that this was merely part of their ubiquitous pres presentism? Or would you agree that it may be something far more sinister? The creation of Rome as having been so depraved as to be beneath consideration, as would also be anything that arose a as a result, uh, like the church and Christendom. I am not here talking so much about what this culture has become, but to something that is possibly baked into the Whig interpretation of history. Do you have any thoughts on this matter? Well, let me think. Um, I don't know about that because uh, given the author of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and uh, really a Whig's Whig, was of the opinion that uh, it was becoming Christian that destroyed the empire. Uh, certainly the Christian empire has come in for a lot of animus in the Whig construction of history. But it is something worth thinking about. Ah, what does what that case look like uh, in terms of Christianity ruining the empire? Well, basically, <clears throat> Gibbon felt that uh, the empire was fine until Christianity came along and weakened its militants by bringing in this, uh, you know, peace-pushing faith that uh, broke down the old religion under which uh, Rome had conquered and introduced instability by virtue of doing so. So it weakened people by making them more passive? Well, yeah, but not, not just that. It weakened the very institutions of Rome. I mean, it's the same argument that the United States are a Protestant nation and should say that way, because that was the faith of the founding fathers. And if you altered that, it would somehow disrupt everything. That 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 that's just such a uh, the the word weaken in that context is so um, insubstantial uh, of an argument. I didn't I didn't say it was a good argument. I just said it was his. You no, know, I know. I'm just saying. I'm just kind of surprised that. Well, see, Gibbons had a particular animus because he had converted to Catholicism when he was very young, and then his father forced him to renege, and then he came to disbelieve in Christianity as a whole. Oh, okay. So he had issues. All right. Uh, <laughs> Youssef says, do you think modern conservative politics respects the church as an institution or just a bulwark against perceived change? Well, it depends on what you call conservative politics. I mean, are we talking about the Trumpster or are we talking about integralists or whatever, uh, it all depends. I would say that for a lot of, of elected Republicans, the church is uh, just a bulwark against change. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, a... Um... A question from a, a new submitter, T.M. Bruzzi. Congratulations on your first question. Um, thank you for becoming a patron. Uh, so he says, Jacques Catelineau Catelino. was a Vendean commoner who fought for church and king against the First <clears throat> French Republic and died fighting. He's commonly referred to as the Saint of Anjou. However, he is not a canonized saint. His beatification paperwork was unfortunately destroyed in a World War II bombing raid. Does no. Charles have any arcane knowledge of Jacques Catilino or the Van Vendean Revolt? And does he have anyone he would like to see canonized that may be obscure or less known? Also, if Vince has any obscure people he would like to see canonized, I'd be interested in hearing that too. Uh, and then he sent me a, a late a side note. Uh, I feel a fool as I load up 249 and see a section on Von Day canonizations. Hmm. 
we we've been talking about this too um are there von day canonizations or not because i feel like we had a question a week or so ago that cited a lack of von day canonizations because of uh that the vatican catering to you know masonic france yeah and it is certainly true that uh <clears throat> it is certainly true that uh, Catelli knows um, um, records were stalled as because of the the wreckage referred to. Um, as far as arcane uh, goes, you know the memory of the Vendée contributed very strongly to the growth of devotion of the Sacred Heart in France. And many of Catellino's um, comrades in arms, their descendants, fought in the Papal Zouaves, 1860 to 70. Um, in fact, uh, Charette, who was a, um, a, a big figure in the, um, in the Vendée, his grandson, I think, was the commander of the deputy commander of the Papal Zouaves. Um, one of my personal favorites of the bunch is La roche Clan, who was a very young man, uh, but went to battle. Eventually was killed, but it was very heroic. I mean, there, there was so many of them, Del Bay and, and, and just, they were an amazing bunch of men, a truly amazing bunch. And I, um, you know, I'm, I'm really in awe frankly, of what they did. But they weren't the only ones. You know, in Tyrol, there was Andreas Hofer uh, and his men who were just as devoted to the Sacred Heart and were fighting the revolutionaries where they were. And there were similar people in Spain and Portugal and Belgium and Italy and, you know, wherever the revolution went, it did have opponents. The um, uh, In the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, the San Fedisti, the uh, Army of the Holy Faith, uh, were guerrillas that fought back. But the Vendée does have, and of course in France, or other areas in Brittany and Normandy and elsewhere, that, uh, the south of France, where there were a lot of similar groups, the Chouan and the Compagnie uh, du Soleil in, uh, around Nîmes. Uh, and these people were all, you know, very, very similar. They were opposed to the revolution because it was opposed to the altar and the throne. The the Catholic altar and whatever throne happened to be, happened to be in the particular country that had been overthrown. Uh, and like the Vendée, they were generally stamped on pretty good. But like the Vendée, they're, uh, in each of the countries where they occurred, their memories played a very strong role in the life of the church afterwards. And very often, not always, but very often in uh, popularizing the cultures of the Sacred Heart in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Hmm. All right. Um, Daniel says, why should I, as a monarchist, vote? Would my time and energy be better spent trying to reverse the culture wars and build up the kingdom of God uh, the kingdom of Jesus Christ here on earth to the best of my ability. Well, first, uh, you're probably not going to spend a great deal of time in the voting booth. Uh, be my first thought, uh, there's no reason you can't do both, but, <coughs> uh, one thing you should remember is that even though your vote may not count for much of anything at the national level, or depending on where you are at the state level, it is of importance in your local elections. And most of the laws you live under are actually made at the local level. So I would think it's kind of important for you to do your best in all the other ways you mentioned. But don't forget that the kingdom of Christ can be defended politically at the local level in various ways. I, uh, I remember in Arcadia, California, sorry, not Arcadia, it was in Monrovia, California that Planned Parenthood was chased out. So there's a lot you could do at the local level politically that you really can't do at a higher level. So 
if you are going to skip any kind of voting, skip the national voting. But don't you miss your local issues. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in terms of your point about the local level, um, Daniel had submitted like, <laughs> there, there are like two pages of comments above in terms of it's highlighted that sort of the helplessness of the monarchist cause and um, stuff like that. <coughs> um, sort of elucidating reasons why it's pointless to vote. Um, but, you know, that's like the bigger society thing too, right? So if you focus on that and you focus on these people who are just like terrorizing you on a, a national level or state level, that's not going to be that's not going to be fun for you. Um, definitely concentrate on what you can do. You know, there are different societies. Uh, as I was reading um, the book Integralism, you know, a society whether it's you know uh, your company is a society, your family is a society. Um, so you, but and so obviously your influence on these smaller societies is so much greater than, you know, what voting on the national level or statewide level. Um, for me, you know, I'm I'm a hot blooded person. I'm not gonna lie. Um, I mean my <laughs> you know, a bit oh, be between all these me, years I've thought you were Mr. Cool as a cucumber. And you do this to me out of national in front of a national yeah, I public. Mean, Thank you. Hot blooded Italian, add the the Magyar and Slovak blood and I'm just Ugh. I, but, you know, you can't do that to yourself to be constantly, you, you have to change your gaze and say, um, okay, the world is crazy, but not here and not me. I'm going to do what they, what everyone else should be doing or what yeah. certain ex, you know, certain people should be doing. Um, and that, that way you take your passion and you're, it's, it turns into a fuel for you to be a positive force in the world. Um, and, you know, it doesn't even have to be something serious too, or something big or exotic or, or whatever. Um, I, I, um, for example, for example, um, I don't think I told you this, Charles, but you'll very, be very pleased. So, um, w uh, there have been a handful of times where um, I've gone to mass and I've seen your brother at the local TLM, right? And your brother does a very unique um, practice, um, which is w when he goes up to confession, he has his hands folded in prayer, to, like to like confession. an altar boy. Or uh, not, not to confession, excuse me, the Eucharist. The yeah. Eucharist. Receive the Eucharist. He, he has his hands folded as if he's an altar boy. And I thought that was interesting. I thought, you know, that's that's kind of interesting. Um, but you know, I uh, just let that sit there for a year or so. Um, and then, you know, I thought, you know, I I feel stupid just, you know, with my hands over my my lower midsection, which is what most people do. So, you know, I ended up doing that, uh, adopting that uh, whenever I kneel, or you know, whenever we're kneeling, um, and whenever go to communion now, I, I always have my hands folded in prayer because I feel that's a more, um, it's a more solemn way to, to celebrate the mass. And so I started doing that and I did it. I started doing it in different church and nobody else would did it. Now I noticed some other young gentlemen are doing it <laughs> and no one was doing it before. And these young gentlemen I've seen, they went to, I've gone to mass with them, or they've been adjacent to me at mass maybe 10 times. So they definitely weren't doing it. And now they definitely are doing it. What and that's a very little thing, but you can see that that's just an example of how uh, don't underestimate your ability to influence the world around you. Well, it's, it's, it's a small thing, but what would you say if I told you that my brother does that because he has hideous tattoos on the palms of his hand? <laughs> Well, I would say that's very ironic. Yeah, it's, just, not, it's not. It's not true. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> oh. 
man. No, no, he doesn't have hideous tattoos on the palms of his He has no tattoos. But no, it's it is true. Um, the <laughs> yeah, yeah. if I can go on, you know, I, like there are other things that are seem small, but to me, that it can influence people. I was just ranting to Charles uh, before the sh- the show that I had gone to the Huntington Library, which is a very nice, beautiful gardens, beautiful art, really wonderful artsy place, um, and. Everybody is dressed horribly and ugly. It's not even about modesty. It's about just like modern, uh, just. Ugh. And I told him, you know, I it may, you know, admittedly, I'm a person who, all my life, I'm guilty of dressing for comfort. But this makes me want to just straight up go everywhere and dress like I I'm a character in Downton Abbey. Just so that, if nothing else, to make these other people feel something different or to take society in a different direction or something. And so I believe just even stuff like that, where the way you carry yourself, the way you dress, that there is sort of, um, it impacts other people. And especially in today's society, if you're dressed like you're go- you're a character in Downton Abbey, while everyone else is dressed like they just got out of bed or just whatever you stand out like <laughs> you're the one who stands out in a good way in my opinion right well i i have to tell you you know i always wear a suit yeah and uh, when i when i fly time and again i get thanked or congratulated by stewardesses and or ground mm. crew it's very peculiar and i i had a layover in ireland flying to the states uh in uh, October, a lower and a short layover. It was like an hour and a half, you know, changing planes in Dublin. But the uh, there was a, a guy and a gal. They were uh, customs people, and the uh, of course this is Ireland, you know. And uh, the uh, lady says, "Well, you look really smart." And uh, the gentleman says, "Yes, I'll say this. Uh, you know, you really dress well, sir." And I said. Well, to tell you the truth, it's just to make the stewardesses' lives easier. Now, that doesn't make any sense, but they both laughed like hyenas, and he slapped me on the back. And... How does it make their lives easier? I don't get it. I don't I don't know. <laughs> I told you it didn't make any sense. It's just what popped out of me. You know I don't control this stuff. I just, you know, let it flow. Wow. But, yes, yeah, so but... I mean, you must have the stories as a person who is always dressed like this for every occasion. You must oh, yeah. be able to see... Whether or not there's an impact here. Well, I mean, I certainly I have I have here. Yeah. Uh, I I'd say that in the years that I've been here, the level of uh, not not that it was ever really, you know, just flat out bad, but I do have to say that the the level of dress has gotten rather more formal since I've been here. Uh, even to the point of an annual formal dinner, which we never had before. This is the students. It's not me. So, uh, you know, that that just developed out of itself. It had nothing to do with me, except perhaps as an oblique influence. Um, and that, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm happy about that. Uh, because, see, the, the fact of the matter is, if you look better, the more formally you dress, the better you look. There's just no, unless... You are Mark Wahlberg in 1992, uh, or his uh, uh, friend there, the uh, Calvin Kleinatz. Only people who look like that can really look good in casual clothing. For the rest of us, it accentuates and exaggerates all of our worst traits. I mean, I've got a gut. All I need is a, is a tight, a tight jeans and a T-shirt. That looked good, wouldn't it? But the uh, the more and of course, if you if you do look good, like those two I mentioned, in formal wear you look amazing. But even if you don't, I mean, there was a character actor called Victor Bono, who you never heard of, but he was a big fat guy. He was in Our Sick and Old Lace, his character actor, but. I remember him in Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, where he plays the uh, the father of the eponymous lady. 
And he said, you see him in white tie. And he looks great. Now, you look at Victor Bono, and I mean, he, he was a fat guy with a big mustache and bald. There's only so much you can do with that, right? Put him in white tie, it looked like a million bucks. It's just the way it is. You know? And I can assure you that these are small things, but they do influence the way you look at the world and the way you feel about yourself. The better you look, the better you'll feel. Now, you can take that in bad directions. I mean, what one of the uh, terrible things we'll see online these days are uh, uh, facelifts gone wrong or uh, stars with too many facelifts. And it really, yeah, it looks aren't everything by any stretch, but they aren't nothing either. And the thing is, the more formal you dress, the more formal you feel, the better you'll behave. I mean, if and if you're in a suit, you'll be perhaps less likely to pick your nose. You just won't feel like it. Now, mind you, there this isn't always true. There are limits and so on and so forth. And, of course, it's sometimes difficult for people to afford uh, decent-looking clothing. But, and here's the big but, you look at pictures of workers 70 and 80 years ago, they're wearing ties. Because in those days, the upper classes tried to dress well and the lower classes tried to emulate them. Now, our, our divine leadership, our great elites, dress like the ragbags they are. And all society follows their lead right off the cliff. I mean, look at the Academy Awards, you know. I'm so old, I can remember when they were still mostly white tie. Then they slowly became black tie exclusively. And then they turned into this weird freak show they've become now. Now you've got Machine Gun Kelly with um, sort of Hellraiser spikes coming out of his oh. suit. That's wonderful. No, um, it's, 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 uh, I'd hate to see him lie down. I know. Um, I mean, but... I you awfully uncomfortable wearing that all evening. I you couldn't even sit. Yeah, but um, you know, I, I this kind of reminiscent of a, of a previous sort of soapbox mo box moment I've had a week or two or three ago um, about the path of least resistance. This yeah. is a, this is a big one. This is a big part of it. Uh, and again, for me too, right? Like I. I I've dressed for comfort my whole life and, you know, just the feeling of it, you have to actively, you know, my fight is I have to actively push myself to put on a, a nice dress shirt, a nice tie, um, and, and a suit, you know? Um, so yeah. Well, you, you get to the point when you get old enough, just getting yourself out of bed requires a lot of pushing. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, um, a lot of food for thought there. I hope you guys really consider some of this stuff. All right. Uh, question from Warren who says, hello, Mr. Frankini and Mr. Coulomb. I'm settling into my new job swimmingly, though I tell you with the cost of gas, this job barely pays for me driving back and forth from here to Michigan for my other job working as an exhibits man in a local museum. Anyway, yesterday was a new calendar feast of Christ the King. Father expressed his dislike of monarchy. I was not persuaded, of course, but it did get me thinking about the Catholic idea that the governments that rule over us are there because of God's active or passive will, and therefore we are obliged to obey them in all things but sin. Please correct me if I'm wrong. How do I reconcile my monarchism with seeing the current regime as the one God allows to rule over us? How does his providence work when it comes to governments? Is it possible for me as a Catholic to say that King Francis II is more legitimate than the current government? All I know to do is pray for the king and his family, the conversion of our government, and to ask God to bring us the king over the water. Well, to a great degree, you've kind of answered your question in the sense that you've got to pray that for the, the rightful king. Uh, beyond that, and this goes back to something we said earlier, you do have to focus on what you can improve 
in your local level, your local area. Um, you really have no control over the national government anyway. So the time doubtless will come when this government topples. What will replace it? We can't say. We can't know. Uh, all we could do is all we could do is the best we can in the meantime. Um, you know, our country is in a certain sense an artificial construct. Uh, I'm not one of those who would like to see it break into pieces. But a lot of people would, and it may be that it will. And it may be that that is more natural. It may be that that is God's will for it. I hope not, because, <clears throat> frankly, I love the country I was born in. I just, I'd like to see it better than it is, but I wouldn't want to see it destroyed. Um, we've got to pray, keep the faith, and as I say, try to affect your immediate area. I'm glad you're working at a museum. That's a very, very good job and a very precious and important one, especially if in times, of the, in times to come, uh, that sort of thing seems unimportant to a lot of people. Make sure it never seems unimportant to you. Absolutely, with the museum. Well, you know, I, I had this moment, you know, I was talking about the Huntington Library. And they have some incredibly beautiful portraits, beautiful China. Um, I don't know. The disconnect between modern man and that world was that much more apparent. Like all these portraits of these people, which I consider, you know, perhaps normal or even relatable, where perhaps modern man might have a totally different view because well, the, this thing is more alien, you know? Well, it is. I mean, the woke would say they were all exploiters living off, uh, you know, slavery or Indian genocide or stolen jam recipes or whatever. And you know how the woke are. They can't, there's nothing, nothing enjoyable or pleasant that they can't screw up if they're given a chance. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I heard a, a lecture once. What I, what I thought it was going to be was about uh, passenger train travel uh, in the United States from 1900 to 1960. Right? Yeah. And this, this sounded like it would be pleasant enough. <clears throat> she, goes, she starts with a diatribe about how all the porters were black, but they couldn't enjoy the benefits of riding in the trains like the white passengers could. Okay, what's your point? And this lady, by the way, was from a railroad museum maintained by one of the major railroad lines in the country. And I thought to myself, self, I thought, why am I listening to this? And I excused myself and I was gone. <laughs> You're self I mean, did a good job there. Well, I don't do woke. See, woke and me, no, no. That's why I stopped subscribing to American Heritage. That's why I've had to quit several organizations, including one I belong to since I was 14. That's why my brother quit the American Legion. We don't do woke. Woke people can make their own money and support their own garbage. And if they annex an organization I belong to, then I belong to that organization no more. All right. Not uh, that I'm bitter. You're, you're getting me worked up here. You're getting me worked up, but I have to, I have to cool myself off. I'm not um, bitter. Oh, actually, this is going to be hard to cool off. Okay, so... Carp in the, carp in the bathtub. Warren has a subsequent question. He says, as to a hopefully less serious question, what are your thoughts on the Oxford comma? Is it legitimate grammar or a Masonic plot to waste paper and ink? Are you mad? The Oxford comma 
is the last stand in grammar against the moronic. That Oxford comma is so important, I always use it, and I have fought with editors throughout my career who wanted me to drop it. No, sir. I'm all for the Oxford comma. I say it's as old as the language. Keep it, and I will take Oxford over Chicago any day when it comes to this. Yeah, I, as a publisher, I, that's the standard for me, Oxford comma. I, I, I actually... I support the Oxford comma so heavily and I'm so passionate about it that it shouldn't even be called it shouldn't even be called an Oxford the Oxford comma because that that presumes that oh it's some sort of exceptional thing. It should be like the podunk gap or something like when you choose <laughs> when you choose to not have a comma there <laughs> you know like that should be the exception, right? Uh I'm sorry that's uh, you said it so perfectly too when we were discussing this. It, it promotes there. There's a symmetry there no. in the sentence. There's and a it, symmetry of the sentence. It's, it, it gives you a pause, a pause, a pause, and then a, and then the full stop. And it's so. <laughs> there's no question. Oxford comma all the way. All, all right. right. Um. Oh wow, boy, this is we're going into another. All right. Helvicio says, Dear Vincent Charles, in the debate between whether William Faulkner or Ernest Hemingway was a better writer, on which side do you fall? William Faulkner. Okay, so... Okay, I, 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 have, to, I have to cool my jets here. Okay, I, I don't want to lose it. I don't want to lose it. So, well, Ernest Hemingway is my favorite writer. Okay, listen closely. Uh, Carp in the bathtub, shoe, fly, shoe. Carp in the bathtub, shoe, fly, shoe. Carp in the bathtub, shoe, fly, shoe. Skip to my loo, my lady. So there. Feel I, better? I, so let's get, I mean, forget. Okay. How do we start this? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Let's put to the side the question of who's better. To me, it's shocking that you should, of all people, pick Faulkner, who made his living based off writing about the decay of the gentry class of the South. Yeah. Which is, in my opinion, um, populist and political, um, saying, ah, you know, look at you guys, you're all going downhill. Um, and then, And then that's who you choose. Well, Hemingway. number one, I don't think Faulkner was very happy about it. Really? What what suggested that? Just the whole tone. I mean, you got to bear in mind, one of the things that makes Southern writing different from Northern is that the South had a sense of tragedy, having been defeated and occupied by an alien power at the end of the war between the states. Uh, and the fact is that in a lot of places, things really did go downhill horribly. I mean, if you drive through the South through any length of time, you'll see the, even now, you'll see the, the reminders of this right, center, and forward. Uh, the, uh, the thing about, I mean, that actually happened, and it was something I've, I've the results of which I've seen myself. But uh, Hemingway, his whole oeuvre was about his search for his own manhood, which is great. And I hope he found it, although he blew his brains out, so I don't know if he did. But uh, that's an interesting quest if you're searching for your manhood. But I'm not looking for mine. I've enjoyed it for many years. Whereas the decay of the Southern gentry is something I can actually relate to. Uh, coming from a family that lost its money and had to make its way. Although, as you put it before the uh, before the show, <laughs> the difference is we didn't stay in decay; we left. <laughs> I see. Okay, I, I and think you and you made the comment that oh, I see. Now we're switching to grapes of wrath. Yeah, which is and ridiculous. I, I thought that was hysterical. Faulkner meets Steinbeck. 
the Sartoris family pack up and move to Hollywood. I like that. I, and you, there's no way you like Steinbeck. So, I mean, that that just shows. I, what, what makes you think I dislike Steinbeck? Do you, do you really like his writing? Do you really Some like it? Cannery Row. Sure. <laughs> I did not like Grapes of Wrath. Um, you did like Rosa Shard because you couldn't pronounce her name. Okay, so. Ro- Rosa Shard, just so you'll know, it's really Rose of Sharon. But Rosa Shard is the way Oki's pronounced it. So. Okay, there's so many you you have so many spots here that I can attack. Okay, so you find the su- the decaying southern gentry class more relatable uh in the themes of of uh Hemingway um which is about his manhood. I find nevertheless universal. It's about responding to grace, about uh discipline, about not wallowing in the mud, about having passion for life. Delving into things you love rather than just drifting through life, some like some tourist. Um, I've enjoyed about not drifting. deluding yourselves, about not a not... A, I've enjoyed drifting through life like a tourist, I've enjoyed it very much. And B, self delusion is the key to positive thinking. And I, where did all of Hemingway's realism bring him? The end of a rifle. That That's biological. I mean that he, it ran in his family. He had this disease. I mean, obviously we don't know, um, but he did become Catholic. Uh, I think his second wife, and he did uh, talk about the joys of Catholicism, even though I feel like he uh, liked it on a superficial level. Um, actually, I don't, I don't even know what Faulkner was. I don't even know what Faulkner was. Faulkner, but... Faulkner was quasi prod Episcopalian, I guess. Mm. But in Hemingway wrote uh, priests well in Farewell to Arms. He respected the priest. He, uh, he did. Of, yeah. He did. I, uh, you know, I'll grant you that. And I didn't say he was a terrible writer. I just said that I found his quest for his own manhood less compelling than the decay of the gentry. I liked his I, My all time favorite novel or novella is Old Man in the Sea. Um, uh, Hemingway is so much more readable. Never, it, Did you really like it, the sound in the Fury as I lay dying, uh, or as I lay dying? Um, did you like? Actually, some of these? I'll tell you a secret. There are really only two of his novels I liked, but I liked them very much. What? One was Flags in the uh, Flags in the Dust, which was his original version of Sartorius. See, it's always the obscure things. Yeah, that I, I was going to say, we got a Charles Coulomb special here. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, if, if you say, what's my favorite Hawthorne? The Marble Fawn. <laughs> and that's of not course. The first, of course. That's not the first thing that would come to a Hawthorne fan's mind. You know, what, what's your favorite Edgar Allan Poe? Some words of the mummy. It's not my <laughs> fault. Okay. Okay. So, I'm drawn to the obscure. What's so the, leave me alone. What's the second Faulkner one? So the uh, the second Faulkner one, uh, golly, it's actually a short story. It's really grim and horrible, but fascinating. A Rose for Emily. Hmm. Terrible, terrible story, but and it's it's actually uh, connected to the Sartorius, uh, 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 what's the word, drama, chronicle, etc. As I lay dying, the sound of the fury, they were a bit sordid. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm saying. Well, that see, that's that's where I'm coming from. Okay, those are the two I read from Faulkner. I thought those are the two big ones. Uh, um, well, you see, there's the problem. Oddly enough, it was the sordid stuff that sold. Yeah. And one of the things about Faulkner that you may not know or care is that he found a certain amount of success in Hollywood as a screenwriter. Okay. And he spent a lot of time at my favorite bar and restaurant, Musso and Frank's. Ah, the plot thickens. Or the cocktail, in this case. (laughs) And, And, wait, there's more. 
after he'd made a certain amount of dough in Hollywood, he was able to go back to Mississippi and ride ever more by moonlight and magnolias and the, the decay of the, the dear old South. What but ethnicity is he? Anglo. German and English. Okay. But one of the things you'll find about, about Southern writers is they do tend to write about grotesques. Hmm. Well, think of Harper Lee. Um, what, to kill, kill a, a mockingbird? Mocking. Yeah. Yeah. Think of Flannery O'Connor. Well, that's definitely true. Think of Walker Percy. I don't know him. Uh, yeah. Ah, well, great Catholic Southern writer, but I mean, a lot of grotesques in their hmm. writing. And the reason, well, Flannery O'Connor put it best. The, um, the Southern writers had a very clear apprehension of the fall of man. I did not, you know, I did not like Flannery O'Connor's writing. I thought she was too brutal. Uh, she Wise speaks Blood, well of you. Wise Blood, and then um, I forgot the the short story with the the Bible salesman, and I, I thought it was too brutal. It's like I thought it was very funny some of it, but I mean, it was it was laughter that. My personal favorite was the Church of Christ Without Christ and Him Crucified. <laughs> but uh, she wrote a, uh, an, an essay that I recommend very highly called The Catholic Writer in the Protestant South. And she made an important point, I think, which is that the, the South may not be Christ-loving, but it's certainly Christ-haunted. I like that line, yeah. And it's, it's, it's quite true. And then the South takes him seriously in a way the North does not any longer. Hmm. The uh, you you never you never hear a northerner talk except, ironically, about a come to Jesus meeting. It's very true. <clears throat> so, hmm. you know, it's it's again, the contemplation of decay has a, a great deal to teach, and I suppose one reason why I see that is because the land I was born in has decayed from the time I became conscious. It's decayed in a in a different way, in a sense. I mean, it's not like old rich, you know? Like... Well, it was a great heritage that our country had, of sorts, that it blew away. Now, mind you, it wasn't nearly as good as what Europe blew away, but it still blew it away. And again, you know, I, I think of the the institutions that I loved so much. The Scouts, the American Legion, the Knights of Columbus, and a lot of other things. And they have paralleled the decay of the society itself. I mean, I'm, I'm so old that I remember when my parents would go to dinner at other people's houses in black tie. Yeah. And that's what was done, you see. Hmm. I... I Remember a lot of things in the before time. And I saw it all washed away. I saw the hippies. I saw the 70s, which was really the institutionalization of the 60s in society. The 80s, it looked like maybe we we're turning things around a bit. The 90s opened up with the fall of communism, which was such sweet bomb. But in the 30 years since then, it's all gone rather swiftly down the toilet. I guess maybe, I don't know. It, it, that's, those seems didn't, the parallel didn't jump out to me as much as perhaps actually just watching Downton. The parallels really jumped out to me there um, between their holding on to, to tradition and, you know, dealing with change. You know, well, and of course, you wonder where they are now. I mean, yeah. obviously not them, but their grandchildren, great grandchildren. Right. Uh, Hotel uh, owners of hotels or something like that. Well, or or I mean, Downton would no longer have a staff of that size any more than the real version Highclere Castle does. They mm -hmm. have a lot fewer people on the estate. They might rent out as a, as a uh, event center you know, weddings and yeah. so on. Uh, you'd be surprised at how uh, frightfully creative the owners of places like that, especially if they're inherited, become to hold on to them. Hmm. 
Oh, good. They, no, it is good. I mean, but it, but it's funny because you know, 150 years ago, they were the dominant class in England, and now it's everything they can do to hold on to the house. There are a few of them who are still extremely wealthy, like the Duke of Westminster and people like that, but they're a minority, very small. Hmm. All right, one last question. Um, okay. And who who finer to ask that question than Von Day Radio? All right. He says, Dear Charles, please, could you elaborate on the holy bread or the panis benedictus, which was often distributed after holy mass in medieval times? The eulogia was distinct from the Holy Eucharist, but came to be received in a partial and anticipatory sense as a surrogate for communion. Well, that's very true. The Pambini, the blessed bread. Uh, it's similar to the antidoron that's given out from the excess bread that has not been part of the Eucharist in the Byzantine rite, only that's given out afterwards. Um it was a very popular uh, popular thing in Poland. I mean, Poland and the French-speaking world were one of the few places where it held on almost to the time of Vatican II. I don't know if anyone does it anymore in the West. Uh, they might, but I don't know. But I know that as late as the uh, mid-20th century, they still did it in Quebec. Um, now, a similar but different sort of thing was St. Hubert's bread which was blessed on, and still is on St. Hubert's Day, November 3rd, to be uh, primarily fed to the hounds to be, who are blessed as a remedy against rabies and so on. But I suspect some of the hunters will take one as well. But the Pambini, uh, it, I don't really know its origins, except that, as I say, I presume it's related to the... Um, Antidoron on the East. That is to say, it probably came from excess Eucharistic bread originally. Let's so, see. Hmm? So what was the purpose? Is it to actually like, literally feed people, you know, the poor or something? Or was it sort of ceremonial? Is there... It's ceremonial. Uh, and it's, it's a sacramental, like holy water. And uh, I'm looking in the, uh, this is interesting, I'm looking in the, um, uh, I'm looking in the, uh, 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 the French Wikipedia, and it mentions it. There's a picture of a lady in Quebec clutching it, giving it out. Uh, the, uh, huh, that's interesting. Well, the um, is a, a recipe, but that's not what I'm looking for. I've never actually seen it, incidentally, unlike the uh, <clears throat> antidoron. Uh, yeah, everyone keeps saying, often until recently, given to the people in French and Canadian churches, when they stop doing it, I have no idea. I see pictures of it being given out uh, in days gone by, but I, I don't see. That's very, you know, there there are even a a few. There are even a few um, places in Louisiana at the turn of the century that still had it, but. I think it's it's pretty much extinct now in the West. Although I could be wrong. I could be wrong. So what do you think about it? I mean, is it something that... Is this a good that was lost? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, one of the... I, number one, you can never have too many sacramentals, okay? You just can't have too many sacramentals. Uh... Without it, you know, you're you're you just don't get that particular blessing. Uh, you know, it's a little bit like the old rite for holy water uh, and the new rite. The new rite, I don't think, has the addition of salt. 
Well, that doesn't desanctify the water, but you don't get the particular blessings, whatever they may be, that come with the salt. And I, uh, yeah, I, I just, I do not, uh, it's, it's just not, not a common thing anymore. So, um, I don't know. Um, I, mean, I guess what, what jumps out to me perhaps is I'm wondering about the psychology of it in terms of, you know, I, I always <clears throat> like trying to carry the feeling of receiving the Eucharist. And I like trying to carry that as far as I can into my day, sort of as a meditation. Um, well, now, if you take the blessed bread with you, you can do that. Well, what, what, what is, to me, it, I'm wondering if the blessed bread can make it more complicated for some people. Like, well, no. this this isn't the Eucharist. This shouldn't be confused with the Eucharist. Oh, believe me, it wouldn't have been because it was done uh, outside of Mass. And, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't have been. Oh, it was done outside of Mass by the priest? Well, the mass, I mean, it... The, well it, was, it was blessed at some point beforehand. And given out after the mass was over. I mean, like, like a Saint Joseph's table or something. Like it's just well, like here's the bread on the side. Pretty much, uh, and usually distributed by either the priests or altar boys. The way this is done with the Byzantines today. Oh. Okay. And believe me, there's never a question of it being uh, being uh, confused with the Eucharist. I see. The. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder if it's just a question of eliminating the expense. Well, I, I was wondering if it had to do with poverty again. Um, I mean, you said it was ceremonial, so I get—I pictured I, perhaps a greater, a more elevated ceremony attached to it. Um, no, it 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 was uh, it was blessed. I mean, again, I'm not precisely sure when they would bless it, but presumably it was before the mass. Or just after, and then it would be distributed after the mass. Hmm. Now, with the with the um, with the Byzantine rite today, they bless a certain amount of bread, a portion of which then is taken to be the Eucharist, the rest of which is just sort of there and is distributed to the people after the liturgy is over. Very often with a sip of uh, blessed wine. Wait, what? After the the liturgy is over? What? Yeah. I don't get what you mean by a sip of blessed wine. So that seems like, what are people lining up also to? Yeah. Yep. Huh. They go up and they they're given a uh, uh, they're given they go up they take the uh, take a bit of the uh, blessed bread, dip it in the uh, blessed wine, and go their eat it and go their way. Wow. Okay. It's a Byzantine thing. You would understand. You no, know, my mom was Byzantine, so yeah, but she's conformed. <laughs> she, I, she has. You know how, how I can tell she's conformed? How is Boris in the uh, in the bathtub? You know, I don't think I've actually. Uh, right when we're done today, I'm gonna go ask her about the carp <laughs> in the bathtub and see if she knows what these shenanigans are all about. Um, Do you want to sing her the song? No, I don't. Carpet in the bathtub, shoe fly shoe, carpet in the bathtub. You don't want to sing that. No, I don't want to sing that. That's not Why respectful. Not? No, that's that's not. Well, who's it I respect for? The carp or uh, or uh, the fly? That's a low class song for high class. Um... Uh, carp. No, it's just I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, whatever. If you don't what? know, I don't know. But there's one thing I do know. What? If it's Monday. It's off the menu. And the soul you save. May be your own. That's two things. I lied. <laughs> Happy Advent, everyone. Happy Advent. See you next time.